If you've been looking up at the screen, you've been reading these words that are up there. Let me read them to you in, in case you can't quite see it or just haven't paid attention to it. Uh, it has everything to do with the message that God's given me. God's laid on my heart. I prayed about it. It was up late. Uh, last night, this morning, couldn't sleep. I was praying for the message, praying for different folks, just running different things through my mind. And uh, I don't know what direction God's going to take this message, but I pray that God takes it somewhere. But let me read this to you. And, and I'm going to ask you if you know who said this. The story of the Ten Commandments. Most of this is a direct quote, but... What I have in parentheses, I had to add to make the sentence make sense. You know the context of it. The story of the Ten Commandments speaks of whether men are to be ruled by God's law or whether they are to be ruled by the whims of a dictator like Ramses. He was the Pharaoh that was in afflicting the Israelites in the time that God sent Moses to deliver them. And you could add into that sentence under the term dictator, Hitler, Mussolini, Emperor of Japan, that was World War II, uh, Pol Pot from uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, the Kim family in North Korea, uh, Kim Jong-un is absolute dictator. The rule of law there does not totally rely upon written law. It's up to the Kim family, especially Kim Jong-un and his sister. His sister's dangerous. Um, but they rule in a God-like fashion over the North Koreans, have been ever since the 1950s. There are modern dictators some of our politicians act as if the power belongs to them and not us. Excuse me. The Constitution started out, we, the people of the United States, not we, the government. We, the people. We are headed in this country toward a dictatorship. Because when man will not be ruled by God's law, he will be ruled by dictators and evil men. God will put them, he said it in Isaiah 19, I think. God said he would send Egypt and put them under cruel authority. So you can add any modern day politician who seeks to increase his or her power over the people of this country or other countries like it. Then he asks the question, are men the property of the state? What is your answer to that, church? No. Men are not the property of the state, which means the things that man owns are not the property of the state either. Or are they free souls under God? You see, when you read the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, it does not give the right for the American people to keep and bear arms. It assumes the right is already given by heaven. The right 
to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, is what it says. But does not give us the right to keep and bear arms. That right is given to us by our Creator, by God, to maintain our liberty, not to shoot squirrels. That's not what the founders intended. Was to, uh, They can have guns as long as they kill possums and squirrels. Or shoot carrots because we'll probably end up vegan in the next 20 years. I don't know what... I don't know what buckshot in a carrot would taste like. but Are men the property of the state or are they free souls under God? This same battle continues throughout the world today. Guess who said that? Huh? Shut up. How did you know? Cecil B. DeMille. You may not have seen this on the TV version, but on the movie version of the Ten Commandments, it starts out with a stage and a curtain, and the director and the producer of the Ten Commandments came out on the stage and gave that speech as to why he made that movie. That was in 1955, 56, somewhere around in there. Let me read that again. This same battle continues throughout the world today. That was, what, almost 70 years ago? 60 some odd years ago that he said that? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. He said it back then and it's just as true today. Now, I've been preaching on uh, God's taking... And using Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, out of bondage, into the promised land. I wasn't sure how I was going to preach this part of the story. There's so much here. Starting with Exodus 19. You can go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Starting in Exodus 19. There's so much there that I would love to just, just go verse by verse by verse with you. But... We would be here for the next week, every day, just listening and, and reading and studying the Word of God. But, so I'll shorten it down to a little bit and just focus on the idea of the Ten Commandments itself. What are they for? Why did God uh, give them this at this particular time? And uh, God right now is putting something in my heart. And God, I'll just tell you, thank you. Now something makes sense to me. But uh, let's read now in Exodus 19, uh, the story of Moses and the Israelites. They've crossed uh, the Red Sea. They've seen Pharaoh and his army uh, drown in the Red Sea. So God has destroyed their enemies. They're, they know that nobody is following them and chasing them. So they have but to follow God as he leads them through the wilderness. And he takes them, uh, the Bible says in chapter 19, verse 1, in the third month. After they've left Egypt, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. That's where Mount Sinai is. Now, if you have a, a map in your Bible, and you look there at the map of, I don't know if I have a map in this Bible or not. I don't think so. As this Bible somebody sent me, it has, a con it has a copy of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights in it. I like it. The Bi it's, it's a special Bible they printed up called We the People Bible. King James Version, Holy Bible. And I like it. But anyway, I don't have a map here. But if you look in the map, if you have a map in your Bible of where it says the Sinai Peninsula... And then it'll show you in the Sinai Peninsula, Peninsula where Mount Sinai is. Take your pen or pencil and cross that out. It's not there. Mount Sinai is not in the Sinai Peninsula. That's Egypt. Mount Sinai, Paul said it was in Arabia. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5 that it was in Arabia. For this, for this Sinai, which is in Arabia, he said it. 
And so the crossing of the Red Sea was made into Arabia, the desert of Arabia there. And they think they know the exact mountain that, uh, it, that it was that where God came down. Because there's just a lot of things there that match what the scriptures say. There's, there's archaeological evidence that sort of tells the same story that the book of Exodus tells about this particular uh, situation. But anyway, beside that, I still believe the Bible no matter what. And uh, so in Exodus 19.10... This is the crux of it. The Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people. Sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. Now think about what God's doing here. God is preparing, not himself, but he's preparing his people to meet the one who was responsible for setting them free. It, it, was, it wasn't Moses. It was God. It wasn't Moses that parted the Red Sea. It was God that parted the Red Sea. He just used Moses as his earthly instrument like he uses us today in this world. There are Red Seas that you and I can part. There's a rod that we can carry with us at all times. It's the rod of the Word of God. Amen. We can be like Moses. Amen. Moses being... The most prominent man, probably in the Old Testament, aside from David, everything about the Israelite to this very day hinges upon the law of Moses. Now the Jews, when they read it, obviously they have a veil over their face, God says, and they read it wrong. They do not understand it. They cannot see who's behind that veil. But one of these days, the veil is going to be lifted and they're going to see. It's not Moses behind there. It's a man named Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Oh, do you remember the day God lifted the veil of your mind? Amen. He let you see Jesus probably for the first time. So God is telling the Israelites to ready themselves. He's saying, clean up a little bit. Wash your clothes. What does that have to do with anything? The Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul tells us, that we desire uh, a new body, a new set of clothes, in other words. And he said, we don't desire to be uncovered when we go to heaven. We desire to be clothed upon with righteousness. And so anytime clothes are mentioned in the Bible, they will either represent the clothes of sin, the stain of sin upon our clothes, Remember the, the man who gave a wedding for his son and the people that he invited could not, did not come. So he invited uh, all the, everybody else that he knew. They didn't come. So he brought in people just walking up down the street. Come on in. I got free food in here. But there was one man there that showed up, did not have a wedding garment on. I don't know exactly what that was. I just know that he wasn't dressed like everybody else. And that man said to him, how dare you come to my son's wedding and get all this free food without putting a wedding garment on. That the, the picture in that is, if you're not born again, you're not going to heaven with the rest of everybody else that is. Because you're not dressed for it. So God says, wash your clothes. That means get yourself clean before God. Be ready against the third day. How many things in the Bible happen on the third day? Well, I can tell you one most important one. That is the, uh, the resurrection of Christ. I got a new Watchman broadcast coming out today. Deals with that number, the number three. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. One of these days, I know that Jesus is going to come down in the sight of everybody in the world. And when he does, and when he's up there, I'm going up there with him. Amen. And now is the time to get yourself ready. Because I don't know exactly when the third day is going to be. But I don't want to be found unworthy and no oil in my lamp. I want to be ready. And so that's what God is telling us here. You apply that or let God apply that in your life however you want to. Now, so it says in verse 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning. Uh, those of you... I'll say it maybe to the young people here. Those of you who don't like to get up out of bed before, oh, I don't know, 1130. 
Read the Bible and find out how many things that God did early in the morning. First thing in the morning, when it was light, that means get up out of your bed and get ready for God. Amen. It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount. How's Jesus going to come down to us? In a thick cloud, amen. And the, and the voice of the trumpet. We're waiting to hear that trumpet now. Exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. Listen, Jesus is our lawgiver. He has prepared us now and is preparing us for the day when He brings us to meet with God one of these days. Somebody say, man, we're going to get to see God. Amen. And they stood at the nether part of the mount, verse 18, and Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace And the whole mount quaked greatly. I tell you that any time God gets close to this world, this world shakes. When the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. Meaning that what Moses heard, he didn't hear in his heart. He didn't think it in his mind. He heard it with his ears. And so did everybody else. Because after God tells them the Ten Commandments, Israel tells Moses, tell God, don't talk to us anymore. We, that scares us. Imagine that. Being humbled before the presence of Almighty God. Because we are so unclean and so unrighteous and so undone. That even if God were to speak to us right now with an audible voice. We would end up flat on our face before God. That's how. That's how holy. God is. He is to be revered by His people, not cursed out of our mouths. Amen? Not cursed in front of other people either. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I ask Your blessings on this message. Lord, um, teach us some great and mighty things today. Father, take over. Take this message where You would have it to go. Whatever direction you choose, Father. But I thank you, Lord, for what I'm about to read. Because you showed me this one day. And changed my life. So, Father, I thank you. I ask you, Lord, to change somebody's life today. With what we read. We ask this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. Amen. Now... Exodus 20. Turn in your Bibles there. Don't look up on the screen. Turn in your Bibles there, and I'm going to show you something. Who in here believes this is God's Word? Say amen. I want to give you something real simple. And I'm going to try to give it to you the way God gave it to me years ago. And it was very simple. For I, I, remember, I don't remember exactly what day it was. I don't remember anything, but I remember... The scene and the setting was that God had me reading and finding the Ten Commandments and reading them. And this is the 70th chapter of your Bible. Seven times ten. That just amazes me. But it makes sense that God would put His Ten Commandments right there. This, this is God's law. Now, I asked the question earlier, why did God do this at this particular time. Let me give you an illustration. In um, 16, whatever year it was, the Mayflower left Holland and came across the Atlantic Ocean and it was carrying that first group of 
pilgrim believers. We call them pilgrims because they were on a pilgrimage. They were coming to what they believed was their promised land. They had been, we're talking about the Puritans, they had been uh, nearly wiped out by Bloody Mary, Mary the Queen of Scots, because she was Roman Catholic and she despised anybody that wasn't a Roman Catholic. And she massacred, I don't know how many Christian Puritan believers. So they were leaving to be able to come to a land where they could worship God the way they believed God was telling them to worship at, without being killed for it. They could believe what they believed God wanted them to believe. They could worship the way they got, believed God wanted them to worship. And they believed that they could build something similar to God's kingdom here on this earth. That was in their hearts and that was in their minds. When the Mayflower finally made it across the Atlantic Ocean and it, and it landed there at Plymouth Rock, before any of the pilgrim leaders, the Puritan leaders, ever got off the boat and set foot on the, on the shores there at Plymouth Rock, before they ever left the boat, they wrote up a document. Does anybody know what it was? What was it called? Mayflower Compact. You know what they were doing? If you ever ever read the Mayflower Compact, I would encourage you to look it up and read it. They were establishing a government for themselves to govern themselves so that when they went off the ship and onto the land, they had the beginnings of a document that was meant to govern them on land. You see, when they're in the boat, who rules? Captain. Captain's always in charge of the boat. So they didn't have a... The only government they had all those weeks and months coming across the Atlantic was what the captain said. But now they're fixing to leave the boat. The captain's authority stops at the deck of that boat. When they step off of that boat and go onto the land, they knew themselves that they needed a government. Man needs to be governed. We're talking about men who were zealous for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, we're talking about people who believed God. But even they knew that they were not going to honor God if they stepped over onto this country and didn't have a covenant that bound them together in a civil politic. A political union that bound them together to where they would all follow the same laws, the same statutes, and the same creed. They knew they needed that document before they set foot and built their, uh, uh, whatever it was, their, whatever what they called it. Uh, Plymouth what? Not Plymouth Rock. Anyway, before they built their town, they needed the government. So here is God. God has now removed Israel from Pharaoh's absolute dictatorship authority. The Jews were under the authority. Whatever Pharaoh said, they had to do no matter what. And if they didn't do it, they would either get whipped or they would be killed. It was that simple. They were a slave and they had no rights. And so Pharaoh owned them. They was, they was like an extension of him. And whatever he willed and wished upon those Jewish slaves, that's what they had to do. And if there was a law written for Egyptians, that didn't apply to the slaves. So they were under uh, Pharaoh's absolute dictatorship authority. God is going to free them from that but he's not going to put them under Moses' dictatorship authority to where Moses, who's leading them, calls the shots and makes up whatever he thinks the Jews need to do. It's not up to Moses. In fact, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came to Moses at a certain point and said, you're sitting here judging every tiny little matter among the Jews. That's not good. You need to set up judges over each tribe and judges over families of 
of 100, families of 50, families of 10. You need to set up other judges to help you rule. And that became law. But God had to give his people a law, a covenant to follow so that everybody was treated as equals. And let me ask you a question this morning. No matter what you've done, do you, do you really believe that some people are less than others? Not in the eyes of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So who's better than someone else on God's scale? No one is. No one is. So God had to give them a law, a written law. And you know what they said uh, in, in Exodus 19? Now I wish I'd have put that in my notes. If you look at Exodus 19 verse 8, look at what the people said to Moses. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They agreed to the covenant and to the law that God was fixing to give Moses. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Moses is acting as a mediator. The people, Moses told the people what to expect. The people said, all that God says to us, we'll do. So they agreed to do what God told them. Moses takes that to God. God says, fine. So God then calls Moses up to Mount Sinai. Not here yet. But out loud from the top of Mount Sinai, God is going to speak these words to his people. And I want you to look at Exodus 20, verse 1. To me, the most profound verse in this whole chapter is verse 1. Now, it may mean something to me. It means everything to me. Because God one day visited me while I'm reading this. And I read these words, and God spake all these words, saying. And the Holy Ghost stopped me right there and said, Mike, do you believe what you just read? And I had to stop and think about it. What, what is he getting at? And God spake all these words, saying. And I realized I wasn't reading Hebrew. I can't. I wasn't reading Greek. I can, but I was not good at it. I was reading English. And God was asking me, Mike, do you still believe that I said all of these words? See, this is where it's really important. Because if you think, and I, I, Chris, I appreciate what you said this morning during Sunday school. He said, if you find one mistake in the Bible, you'll say to yourself, well, if there's one mistake, there's, I wonder if there's more. I wonder if the Bible can be wrong somewhere else. And now you're on a journey going through your Bible looking for mistakes instead of looking for grace and looking for faith. Looking for righteousness. You're looking for God to be wrong about something. Let me tell you, God's not wrong. And God, God was going to treat everybody from Moses on down to the youngest child. He was going to treat every one of those Israelites as equals, including God. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus ever break one of these commandments? No, not one. Meaning that God himself, is Jesus God? That Jesus himself, God himself, kept the same law that he required of everybody else to keep. I'd say that that makes everybody equal in that sense. Amen? Don't you think that our politicians in Washington and Jefferson City and Hillsboro need to hear a sermon like this where somebody can get to them and say, listen, you are no different and no better than the people that sent you here to rule over them. It is we the people, not you the government. You have no right, no authority 
that we don't give you. Our problem is we got too many stupid people in this country that are giving out bad authority. It's all going to catch them one of these days. Amen. But just ponder that for a minute. God spake all these words saying... And then he starts with all ten of the commandments. And you have to ask yourself, do I believe that God said every one of these words? Because if you don't, there's no sense in you listening to me any longer. Because all I'm going to tell you to do is believe what God said. And if you look at these commandments and think, well, I think one of them... Me and God have this thing worked out. Right? You ever heard anybody say that? You ever said that? Verse 2, I am the Lord thy God. Let's, let's read the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's commandment number one. Number two, verse four, thou shalt not make unto thee any. How many graven images? Any. Any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the who. You know, it just occurred to me that, I don't know, maybe God's got a little double meaning going on here. The guys who want you to call them fathers... Yeah, Jerry gets it. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the ch do you Do Catholic priests have kids? Yep! There's at least 10,000 children that they know of for sure that are the children of Catholic priests in this world right now. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. See, if you make an idol and bow down to it, you hate God. That's what he just said. Every Catholic that you know hates God. They would rather bow to an image than bow to God. And God says, I'm jealous and I won't have it. And some people who call themselves Christian, treat this commandment like it's merely a suggestion. The Catholic Catechism even goes so far as to remove this commandment completely out of the Catechism list of Ten Commandments. It breaks up the Tenth Commandment into two parts. They took it out. They hate God. The real God. Uh, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my what? Will you be like Israel? Will you say unto God today, all that thou hast said, I will do. Verse, six, uh, verse 7, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. I learned early on that taking God's name in vain will either taste like soap or blood. Amen? I didn't... I got raised, you don't say, oh my God. You don't say Jesus Christ as an exclamation about something. You know what really gets me now? Is that they put one of the worst curse words in the middle of Jesus Christ. That makes me shoot mad. I didn't say that. It makes me angry. For you to defile my Savior with that kind of tongue. You have no idea what my Savior did for me. You know, I go around 
All these guys with military hats. And I saw another couple at Walmart do the same thing. They passed a guy who had a Vietnam hat on. And so I heard them say to the guy, Sir, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. So I go around, and if I see these guys with the hats on, I go up to them, thank you for your service. And if they, we've got time, I ask them, where did you serve? What did you do? Get them to talk about it a little bit. And I just have a good time doing that. And I appreciate these guys that served their country. And if I saw somebody that was cursing one of these guys with a Vietnam hat on, calling them names like baby killer and everything else, I think I would just jump in the middle of that one. And I think I'd stand up for the guy who lost his buddies and saw their blood spilled all over the place just to try to keep some people free from communism. That gets me. I wouldn't let them curse them and I don't like it when people curse God. Don't take his name in vain. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What day is the Sabbath day? Yesterday. Saturday. It's not church day. Church day is today. Rest day is yesterday. Saturday. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How do we do it? Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You know what I did years ago as pastor of Bethel Church? I would come over here on Saturday and I'd do work. And I would just, it was like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I'd say, man, I got to go do some work. It's Saturday. I'd be over here. I'd be doing work wherever. And I'm like, I, I, I can get away with it. I'm the preacher. I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be holy. I'm supposed to be here. God dealt with me and said, Mike, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You've got it turned backwards. You think you're serving me, but you're not. I told you to rest. I gave you that as a blessing to you. Not a curse. That if you, that if you're not doing everything you possibly can every single day, then I'm going to be upset with you. You have a, a weak body. It needs rest. And I want to tell everybody here, give yourself a day of rest. Take it. It'll do you some good. Amen. Boy, God just, He wrote a good law, didn't He? Honor thy father and thy mother, young people. That's another thing that gets me is when kids curse their mom and daddy. Now they do it to their face. And mama don't do nothing about it. Daddy don't do nothing about it. They curse their parents because they hate their parents. They hate their parents because their parents are trying to keep them from being stupid. Amen. Even lost parents. Now I know there's some bad examples out there. But he said, honor thy father and thy mother. That thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. You know what that means? He says it a differently in a different place. Thou shalt not, do, thou shalt not murder. Jesus said that. He doesn't mean take any life whatsoever. Obviously, he doesn't mean that because he's fixing to initiate Levitical sacrifices. Every day, blood's going to be spilled on that altar. Every day. So when the, the liberals around you start telling you, well, God said don't kill, and you're killing animals and eating them. You're violating God. No, ma'am. God just told me not to murder you for saying that. Amen? You ought, to, you ought to feel blessed that God thought of you and put a commandment in here that's talking about you. Just don't hang around liberals. Amen? Thou shalt not kill. That means do not commit murder. It is against God's commandment. God favors life. And life begins 
Conception day. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not vote for politicians that kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is, one of the, this is the most adulterous generation that this nation has ever seen. The adultery extends, the fornication extends all the way down into childhood. And I'm not necessarily talking about children molested. I'm talking about children getting on the internet with other children. wicked thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not steal don't steal from your neighbor don't steal from anybody else don't steal from your family don't steal from the government don't steal from God will a man rob God that's in the book of Malachi will a man rob God you say, wherein have, we, wherein have we robbed God? In tithes and offerings. I don't preach much on tithes and offerings because I just like to stay away from people saying, oh, he's just preaching for money. That's all them preachers do. He's got their hand out every time. You can't count on one hand the number of sermons I've preached on tithing and offering and giving in the last 10 years. But I ought to preach it more. God said 10%. How hard is that to figure out? Probably the easiest thing that God could have given us is the easiest formula for it. 10%. That means take one zero off. Amen? Take one zero off of it. If it's $100, $10. If it's $1, 10 cents. See how easy that is? Thou shalt not... Bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. This is, my friends, the law of God. Somebody say amen to God's law. Deuteronomy 33, Moses said, he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. And he shined forth from Paran. And he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand. Went a fiery law for them. And I keep thinking of how they pictured that in that movie, The Ten Commandments. And, and, and I know, I watched the documentary on it here a while back. And I know how they did it. It was pretty cool. They used gunpowder. And, you know, it comes out in fire. I like it. But the Bible says that God's word is a fire. Amen. It's a consuming fire. But the law was written by God's own hand, spoken by God's mouth. Now, let me apply this to uh, kind of how the, the direction we've been going with these messages. Those of you who are wishing and hoping for something better in your life. You're hoping uh, maybe for, I don't know, better better job or maybe you're hoping for better a better family. Uh, maybe you're hoping for better marriage. Maybe you're hoping for... Uh, any, you're hoping for there's things in your life that you want God to take away. And so you, that's your promised land. That's, that's where you want to be. You're not there yet. But be patient. And follow God. He's going to lead you there. Do you believe that? Do you believe God will lead you there? Do you believe? That what you've prayed for, God will either give you what you prayed for or far better than what you prayed for. A land flowing with milk and honey sounds pretty good to me. I like milk and I like honey. Both of them ain't good for diabetes. Amen. But that's where you want to be. And I'm here to tell you that God, through this example, He's going to lead you there following Get behind him, 
follow him. Stay right there with him. When God says, get up, we're moving. You get up and let's go. Amen. When God stops, you stop. Go about your business. Pray every day. Read your Bible. But when God moves, I promise you, he will not leave you behind. Somebody say, how many, how many Jews did that fiery cloud leave behind in the wilderness? None. None of them ever got lost. None of them ever ran away and, and missed, missed the, the leaving. God got everybody up all at the same time. They all marched and followed God. They didn't know where they was going. They had no choice but to follow God. Amen. So, or those, those, listen now, those who have or maybe still do struggle with what they call dependency now, alcohol dependency, drug dependency, uh, illegal narcotic dependency. It's all, it's all addiction. It's all sin. Uh, pornography addicted. Addicted to adultery. You just have a way with just about every girl that walks by you or you're a lady and you're pretty good at picking out the right guys and, and it's a real problem. I know some people like that. The promised land is where God makes you free. The journey of getting there is what we're trying to understand as we go through this. Now, you, you could say, okay, pastor, what's the meaning behind giving us the Ten Commandments? I mean, we already know right from wrong. Well, it's, it's a lot more than that. It's all about someone, listen to this now. It's all about someone setting boundaries for you. Because you need boundaries. I didn't read in Exodus 19. I want you to study that on your own. Read Exodus 19. It'll blow you away. You'll see trumpets blowing. You'll see the Lord coming down. It's all, it looks like the rapture in Exodus 19. It does. It does, man. Moses says, come on, Israel, let's go up and meet God. Woo! I'm ready. But in that, God said, Moses, I you to set up a, a barrier all around Mount Sinai. Put up big rocks if you have to. Make sure that nobody, man or beast, sets not even their big toe on the base of Mount Sinai. Because if they do, I'm going to kill them right there. They'll die. So they set it up all around Mount Sinai. And Moses told them, be sure that you do not set foot on Mount Sinai. Why? Because God is holy and you're not. It's that simple. That simple. What you think of yourself is an elevated, bloated, mis conception of who you really are when you start thinking about who you really are and not what you want to think of yourself maybe you'll stop hating some people that you hate because you realize oh, I ain't no better than they are maybe you'll start forgiving people because you yourself want to be forgiven. Amen. Maybe you'll end up just being a better person all around. Because you realize that the people that you look down on really are no worse than you.
And so God set a boundary. And he said, no one is to cross this line. If you do, you will die where you stand. I will not tolerate it. God, you must remember, is a thrice holy God. The angel saying for eternity, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. They say this forever because God is holy. He's to be revered. He's to be feared. Amen. And see, part of your problem that got you in the mess that you're in now is that you didn't follow the rules. You thought the rules were for lesser people, not yourself. Don't ask me how I know all this, but I know it. You think that they're made for everybody else except you. But you're wrong. God didn't say, okay, I'm going to say who can come up on Mount Sinai. God didn't say that. God said nobody is to touch this mountain when I'm there. Nobody is. What does that tell you about Moses? Whom God lets come up there. Moses, the Bible said, Moses... God said it to the Israelites. When, a, when I want to speak to my people, I'll speak to a prophet. Or I'll speak in a dream or a vision. But Moses is not so. With Moses, I speak face to face. Boy, to be like Moses. Amen. But the Ten Commandments were given to us. Because we need rules and barriers and fences. Electric fences with barbed razor wire on the top of it to tell us that we can't go there. If you're trying to break free from alcohol, don't ask your bar buddies to help you. They won't. Because when you get ready to break and want to drink, they'll pour it for you. Cursed be anyone who puts the bottle to his neighbor's lips. The Bible says that. It says it better than I just said it, but it says it. If you can't stay off of stuff on the internet maybe you don't need the internet you know we got along for thousands of years without the internet any other addiction it's the same thing somebody has to set rules and boundaries for you because you'll never set them for yourself and even if you do let me tell you a, a story. Some of you will recognize this. Some of you won't. So I'm not going to say who it was. But there was a time when there was a, a lady. And her husband passed away. And after a while, she met another fellow. And... She was a member here, and she wanted to get married. He didn't, because he had been in two or three bad marriages before. And he didn't like how they turned out, because these women got all of his stuff. And so he turned down any idea of marriage to this woman well they split up but after a while they got back together and unbeknownst to me they decided to go on a cruise together and they this man still did not want 
a real legal marriage. He didn't want a marriage license. And I knew why. He had told me. He made the mistake of telling me why he didn't want to get a marriage license. Because he said, I got married two or three times before. They took me for everything I have. They used that marriage license. And he said, I'm not doing it again. I got a farm. I got my stuff. I got everything I want. And I don't want somebody else to end up with it in a divorce. And so he just dug his heels in and said, I'm not doing it. They knew my stand on it. So unbeknownst to me, they decided to go on a cruise. And when they got on the cruise ship, they looked at each other, held hands, and made promises to each other. And then shacked up on the cruise ship. And then she moved in with him. I had to deal with this. And I didn't want to. Tell me why the guy didn't want a marriage license. Tell me why he didn't even want a witness. They didn't do that. They didn't ask the captain to marry them. They went into their room, looked at each other, held hands, made promises to each other, and said, we're married now. Even a simple, I call it an in and out marriage. I got one of those. It takes about three minutes. And that even by law requires two witnesses. There was no witnesses to this. I have no idea what they said to each other. No idea what promises they made. Why would a person make a promise to somebody, but he doesn't want anybody else to know about it? That's easy to figure out because he already told me why. So that if he got ready to cut this off, he could do it cleanly and she had no right to anything that he had. He could just kick her out the door and say, there you go. We're not really married. Get out. This is my house. I'll live how I want to. We got into quite an argument. And I confronted him over what he had told me. I knew exactly why he didn't. He admitted it. And I pleaded with him. I begged him to reconcile this and let's do this thing right. And he just absolutely refused. And here's why I'm telling you this. When you make promises to yourself, you're the only person you're going to let down. And that way, you can do it, and nobody else knows. Now you still have the same problem that you did before. Everybody needs barriers. Everybody needs rules. Everybody needs walls to keep us away from things, this, well, here's what Paul said, the sin that does so easily beset us. And if it's too much for you to go to a bar and just talk to the fellas, you can't go to the bar no more. You can't take cough medicine no more. There's just a whole list of things if you drink that you just can't do anymore, ever again. Same way with drugs, same way with, with uh, sex, or same way with adultery, same way with pornography, same way with anything else that you could get addicted to. If you don't, the courts are full of people on probation who made empty promises to a judge that they would get better. But they don't follow the court rules either. So what makes them think, if they're not going to follow what a court does, says to them, how are they going to follow what they say to themselves? It's never going to happen that way. You have to ask, if you don't ask anybody else, ask God, 
to help send somebody to help you put barriers around your life. And those barriers are equal. Everybody has to be. So let me, let me just throw this out to you. Would it be okay if I let some of you in the church drink, but I'm telling Roy, Roy, stay away from that now. That's not good for you. Would it be okay for me to drink or to let, I don't know, John? Would it be okay to let anybody else do it? No. Everybody follows the same rules. That's the covenant that we are under. This is the covenant that saves us and the covenant that we agreed to keep. All that thou hast said, God, we will do. My answer to you this morning is, will you do it? Let's bow our heads. Oh, I really appreciate you coming this morning. I do. I, I thank God for you. And uh, God's blessing our church. God's sent us some new families. And we, boy, we appreciate that. And we're getting to know them. And we like them. And. And uh, I just want you to know that you're loved here and that I just don't, I don't like favoritism when it's against me. So I can't like favoritism when it comes to anybody else or even my family. I promise you, I will preach this just as hard to my own family. And to myself, as I do anybody else. My children need barriers, guidelines, rules, barbed wire fence. And so do I.